We are going to start the final chapter today, so um, I know we have some things to go back to in vision, but we're going to talk about the chemical senses, starting with the taste system. For taste, uh, we have a similar argument or um, debate about how how this neural firing works, right? How, how are our experiential qualities really represented in the brain? And so I'm going to remind you of this argument from before where it could be population coding, where what we mean is a population of really many neurons are going to fire and that they're each going to have their own firing rate. So it is that pattern of firing across that population of neurons, that's going to represent some, in this case, some specific taste quality. So salty is going to have some neurons are going to fire, some neurons are going to fire differently or less, and, and so on, right? And then some neurons won't fire, but it's the population and that um, pattern of activation across that population versus specificity coding, where what we're saying is a single neuron is going to respond to a specific taste. And we're going to see in some of these studies, it, it can be several neurons. So I have these neurons, they respond to salty. They don't respond to sweet, bitter, and sour, and umami. These different neurons, they respond to sweet and not to those other taste qualities. So each is responding to its specific taste. So this neuron, or really these neurons, them that when, when they are firing, we're going we're gonna to experience this taste because they represent a specific taste quality. In what is my mind, a really classic study uh, comes from Robert Erickson in 1963, where uh, the way he examined this question was he was looking at these different neurons in the corda tympani. So these are different nerve fibers, A through M. And he measured how many impulses per second, how many times per second are these neurons firing along the corda tympani <clears throat> for these three taste qualities. So the red is ammonium chloride, the green is potassium chloride, and the open dots are sodium chloride. And so what you see in this across fiber pattern, right, is that ammonium chloride and potassium chloride, they look kind of similar. A and B are firing, C a little bit less. There's this funny pop-up at D, but otherwise, E through M, what we see is yeah, E through G are firing a little bit, and then H through M are kind of not really firing much at all. So that's the pattern. Uh, whereas for sodium chloride with those open dots, you can see how really different that across fiber pattern is, right? Because um, G through M are firing a lot, except for L. Um, and then the other ones are, but so there, but those, those particular neurons look really different than um, the other two taste qualities. And then they went and measured the perception for rats. And so in measuring the perception for rats, what they did um, was they would start with something like with one of the, the two that are kind of similar. So let's say ammonium chloride. They started with ammonium chloride. And while the rat was drinking water with this ammonium chloride in it, they would shock the rat. And so now that rat is getting this, it's really aversive conditioning, right? Where that, now they're going to avoid that particular taste. And then they gave the rats a choice between potassium chloride and sodium chloride. And the rats only drank the water with the sodium chloride. They avoided the potassium chloride, suggesting that it tasted very similar to the ammonium chloride. And they did this the other direction as well. So they would start with potassium chloride in water, shock the a different set of rats, and then um, give them the choice between ammonium chloride and um, sodium chloride. And those rats would choose sodium chloride. So clearly sodium chloride is, um, is being distinctive here and tastes different, and the rats are still willing to drink it, suggesting that ammonium chloride and potassium chloride taste similar and that matches this across fiber pattern if we're looking for the actual like pattern of activation of those neurons. For humans, they could just go ask them, right, do these taste similar or how do these, and, they, and ammonium chloride and potassium chloride taste similar to us, and sodium chloride tastes different. So it looks like, according to this research, that for, it looks like it's population coding, right? It's this pattern of firing across these neurons. Some of the research that has found evidence for specificity coding, it takes a really different perspective. And I say this is early in the taste system, but if you think about how um, how this how a particular taste cell or how a particular cranial nerve fiber works, remember that's a single nerve fiber, a single axon coming from 
a single taste cell. And so we're looking at those um, fibers in the corda tympani. We're looking at particular neurons coming from particular taste cells. So, uh, but early in the taste system, uh, the way Ken Weller and his colleagues examined this question was to do this genetic cloning with mice. And so a normal mouse um, does not have a receptor for PTC, which is phenothiocarbamide. It is a bitter substance. Um, usually bitter suggests something is poisonous. This does actually have um, some small amount. It is, it is a poison. Um, we have PTC strips and we can taste them. That's not super poisonous, but, um, but it is bitter and it does denote poison. And so a normal mouse with no PTC receptor, what you can see in the figure is we can add and add and add PTC and get that concentration higher and higher. And the normal mouse, because they have no PT receptor, receptor, they simply do not taste that PTC and it does not affect how much they're drinking the water. However, if they're adding, so they genetically clone mice that to have that PTC receptor and you can see that they start, they're drinking the water, but the higher the concentration of that PTC, um, the less they drink the water. So it looks like we have a specific receptor actually for this specific taste, not just bitter, but but PTC, this specific taste. And Weller and his colleagues did this in um, another direction. So we just talked about PTC or phenothiocarbamide. Um, this is cyclohexamide, the CYX. Uh, so a normal mouse has the CYX receptor and they avoid. So they did that same thing of raising the concentration in the water of um, cyclohexamide and they avoid it because it tastes bitter, but, they can cl that, but they've made these transgenic mice, they cloned mice to have no cyclohexamide receptor, and now they don't avoid the water with the cyclohexamide. So again, suggesting that we have a specific receptor responding not just to bitter, but to this specific um, bitter taste. I'm going to go through two more pieces of evidence that are both taken as um, or interpreted as being evidence for specificity coding. And I'm, for the second one, I ask you to make your own kind of decision. But so um, if we look at the blue dashed line, um, you can see that uh, the specific neuron is responding to different substances where the ones on the left, the N1, N2, those ones on the left are um, salt, salty. Uh, the ones kind of in the middle, we have a bitter, bitter sour together, put together. And then the ones on the right are sweet. So they, they chose these specific substances that would give us these specific taste qualities. And you can see that what this, the neuron on the top in A, what it responds to is the blue dashed line. It responds basically to salty. And interestingly to that one SA, um, whatever that is for sweet. But mostly it's otherwise, it's not really responding very much. It, we could call it a salty neuron. The neuron in B, you can see it, you can see it has its pop-up. So again, we're looking at the blue dashed line. It has its pop-up at salty. It also has a pop-up. It responds a lot to those bitter and sour tastes. Okay, and so now they go and they apply a milleride to the tongue, and that blocks the flow of sodium to the taste receptors. And what we see now is we see a decrease in the responding of the neurons in um, in a, right, that just responded to salt, now they don't respond to anything. We, that, that sodium doesn't cross the tongue and they're not really responding at all. But for the one that was responding to salty and to bitter sour, it responds the same as it did before. So taken as specificity coding, we have these specific neurons that are responding to something like salt. I will say, so I'm gonna, throw in my monkey wrenches into these, I think, very complex arguments of specificity versus population coding for taste. Um, what is this neuron that responds to salty and to bitter and to sweet? And if, if sodium can't go to the tongue, then how is it responding to those salty? What is it responding to for those salty tastes? I don't know, and I, <laughs> I don't understand. And that a little bit bothers me, and I'm gonna say the same thing for the next one. There, 
interpretation I don't think I completely agree with and it just a little bit makes me more confused in, in some ways. And so now we're back to figures that are showing me one through 65 are, are all, those are separate nerve fibers in the corda tympani. I'm sorry, 66. These are 66 nerve fibers in the monkey's corda tympani responding to um, some basic tastes. And so our sweet, if you remember, we did these sucrose and um, sodium chloride. We're getting the, for something that's sweet, we see neurons one through 13 are responding. And then we have some pop-ups here and there where the neurons respond a little bit. For salty, so for sodium chloride, 17 through 37 respond quite a bit. We have a few that don't respond very much. We have another little pop-up there, 45, 49. Some of those respond some to salty. Uh, to sour, so hydrogen chloride, those first ones aren't responding very much at all. You can see a few little pop-ups there, though. I mean, that's something, that, that's one thing I want you to kind of notice and think about. Uh, so 21, what's going on with 21 and, you know, 20, 19? Uh, but then we have this about 43 through 50, 50. They're, they're responding really well to um, hydrogen chloride, to quinine, which is bitter. Uh, let's say it's 55 through about 61, 62 are responding pretty strongly to bitter and nothing else, maybe a teeny tiny pop-up for that one around 25. But so this was taken as evidence for specificity coding that we have these specific neurons that are responding to specific tastes. And I asked the question, what do these graphs seem to be showing? And I, he's taken this particular one out of the textbook, even though I find the amylaride study much more confusing. Um, as to how we are interpreting it. And I find this one um, really well designed uh, to me, that we are looking at those specific taste qualities that we know we have, this is the taste we're tasting, and we're looking across these 66 fibers, which I think is awesome and really neat. And if we, and it, so when I look at this, I think, well, what about those ones around 45 through 50 that are kind of responding to salty and sour? and maybe bitter. So here we are at those ones that are responding maybe a bit to all of to all of those. Um, they the dashed this there's this dashed line going through neuron five. You can see neuron five responds to sweet and to only sweet. So that was part of what was is the evidence of hey, this is a specific neuron. It's responding to a specific taste quality. This a little bit to me reminds me of that while well, we ended up with sparse coding for vision uh, this is really still early in the taste system. We're talking about fibers that are coming from the tongue and going to the brain. Um, but some of them appear to be re responding to more than one thing, and it suggests maybe, maybe a sparse coding to me. But that's my interpretation, and oftentimes students don't agree, and that's fine. Or they say something else, and that's fine. And something that, that I've added just to throw in this other monkey wrench to say that, hey, this is a clearly a very complicated issue, a very complicated argument, and some of the evidence is also complicated. Uh, so this is a neuron's response to a five second presentation. And so this is one neuron. And what you can see is the S is sweet. And what happens at that five second presentation it takes so we can see this little pop up and then that kind of middle part um it starts to it gets it's slow to start and then it starts and it's never really fast salty so n is the sodium chloride it takes a little while to start and then we have a burst and then it slows down sour so the hydrogen chloride kind of similar but that burst is a little bit earlier and it doesn't slow down quite the same way we have these other little bursts and then quinine the bitter the bottom one we have a couple couple little tiny bursts same about almost the same amount of time as for the sour and then we have a burst and then it kind of stops and then it comes again back in later so it looks like there's a temporal pattern a, a pattern across time that could also be um telling me about taste quality and again this is a single neuron which suggests maybe a pattern of firing across neurons and these other 
studies didn't look at what was happening across time, and it really throws in the monkey wrench to say this is a really complicated uh, question that has not been answered, which is kind of cool in itself. It's kind of it's really kind of neat to see some of these really open-ended questions that we're still trying to figure things out. And we get to um, our pathway through the brain that we went from the um, taste fibers through the cranial nerves, synapsing, synapsing in the nucleus of the solitary tract, going to the thalamus, and then to the insula and frontal operculum. Well, the, this is providing, so we've talked about for all of our sensory modalities, we've talked about the um, organization or the structure the mapping of of that structure, right? What is the structure of the structure? What is the, how is the insular cortex organized? And so in this study um, from Schoenfeld and, and colleagues in 2004, what they found um, was that these are six individuals in those six different pictures and that each individual had their own mapping or structure. That this, the mapping of the insular cortex, our primary taste receiving area is individualistic for us. So we see, um, we're going to talk about when we talk about genetics for just a second, we have different genetics, we are tasting things differently, we have different receptors, we also have different representation in the brain. So I'll come up to one of my questions. Let's take the person on the right in the middle. You can see all this green. They have a lot of their brain is responding to sour. Does that mean that they eat a lot of sour things and they like it? Does that mean that they're overpowered by sour because so much of their brain is responding so they don't like it? I mean, this is, so we are having really different experiences when we're tasting things, when we, um, we, are, we are not having the same experiences our, as our friends. And some of this is uh, experience dependent plasticity and how we are brought up and um, cultural acceptance of things, but some of it is also gonna be uh, genetic and then how are things mapped in the brain and how much space is devoted, how much cortical space, right, does something get? So it's a really, really, um, again, re really complicated and um, kind of neat questions to think about. And also it's a good thing to remember when we are um, kind of arguing with somebody about whether something's spicy or salty or bitter that they we could just be having different experiences of, of this um, completely for lots of reasons. I mentioned, I've mentioned genetic differences now a couple of times. One, when we were talking about the rats, or I'm sorry, they were mice, they were transgenic mice um, with uh, different receptors, either genetically cloned into them or out of them. Uh, but we also see genetic differences in humans. So we have different reactions to that phenothiocarbamide. And I used to do this in the classes, but then people were putting something in their mouth and taking it out. I wasn't sure, especially after the pandemic, I was less and less comfortable. Uh, plus one of my colleagues said, well, phenolthiocarbamide is a, is a poison, <laughs> but it's only like a little strip where you just taste it. Um, don't want to taste it a whole bunch of times, but it's a, um, but it is, it is bitter and some of us taste it and some of us don't. So at this um, American Academy of, for the Advancement of Science, I think that's what that acronym stands for, this meeting in 1934, uh, Arthur Blakesley, uh, he had actually, he had had this experience with his um, colleague, I think it was Arthur Fox, where Arthur Fox was sitting there pouring uh, PTC from one thing to another, and um, Blakesley got it down his throat, and he said, what are you doing? That's what that's getting through in the air, and it tastes, and the other guy was right, right in his face, and he said, I don't, I don't taste anything. I'm not experiencing this at all, and so um, Blakesley was curious, and he went to this meeting, and he um, just picked, like, just as people came in, they tried this PTC. And what you can see is about two thirds of them found it to be bitter. About almost one third of them found it to be completely tasteless. And about 6% of them found it to have some other taste. Um, usually they say that it's not enjoyable, but it's not bitter. Um, so a little over two thirds of the people are experiencing something with PTC and have some receptor for this specific substance, those people who are finding it tasteless, they simply do not have 
a PTC receptor. They don't have those receptors. And so at some point, the people who taste PTC were called tasters, and the people who don't taste PTC were called non-tasters. Uh, so I had this hypothesis that um, my mother was a taster and the rest of us were non-tasters because even though she drinks coffee, coffee black, and she'll only drink it black and hot, really hot, um, she doesn't like the bitter greens, she didn't like dark chocolate, she didn't like any of those bitter tastes, uh, and the rest of us do. But I took home PTC strips and um, we all tasted the PTC. So that was not what was happening. And it turns out that some of this is more complicated. Um, the genetics and the, um, the receptors are more complicated than just this. And one of these complications is the um, number of taste buds on the tongue. So Lin Linda Bartoshuk is um, one of the people who does a lot of research in the field of taste. And she did this video microscopy where she went and counted the taste buds on people's tongues. And they could see that um, people who were sensitive to this, in this case, it was PROP, this 6 in propyl thiouracil, um, so another specific bitter substance, they had higher densities of taste buds. So they had more taste buds than those who could not taste PROP. Um, and so again, there are ways to test yourself. You can get the PTC strips and I have some in my office if anybody wants to come by if you're in town, whenever you're in town, um, where you can taste whether or not you taste PTC. But there's also, so one of my authors in one of my biopsych textbooks has a, the exact, so you, you take this little um, wax paper, you cut a hole of particular diameter, so a circular hole, and you dye your tongue blue, and then you can count your taste buds. And I've had one student say she did that in sixth grade, and she had lots of, lots of taste buds, more than a lot of people, and she wondered if it was still true. But so really, my point with all of this is they're difficult questions and they're interesting questions. And again, we all do have different experiences and you can find out more about your own um, individual taste experience in comparison to others with some of these uh, kind of neat ways of, of examining the question. And Del Witch et al. in 2001 showed that it wasn't just the density of taste buds alone, that there are also um, these genetic differences in the kinds of receptors that so they went in and stimulated the same number of receptors in tasters and non-tasters, and they found that tasters have these specialized receptors that are absent in non-tasters. And then eventually they came up with this um, nomenclature to add super tasters. So people who might be especially sensitive to prop and probably more and probably more sensitive to other bitter substances. And so my new hypothesis became that we're that so my family was were tasters, but my mom was a super taster because she was clearly particularly sensitive to those bitter substances and she really um, didn't like them. All right, that's me finishing up with taste. We will continue with olfaction.